here to find, as I informed you earlier, our model of influenza is now being modernized. It would be most welcome if you could supply me with schedules of daily passenger air service, including types of planes, between any of the 50 cities according to the list enclosed. Looking forward to your reply, your sincerely, Professor Leonid Rachov. Gamalei Institute, Moscow. That letter arrived here at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in August 1981. To Dr. Paul Fine, an expert on the spread of infectious diseases, it seemed a reasonable request from an acknowledged mathematician. He sent him copies of the ABC World Airlines Guide, a vast compendium of all airline routes and interconnections. A similar request was received by scientists in Australia and the United States. All this information was fed into a large mathematical model Ravachev was preparing, which sought to predict how a major pandemic virus, influenza, would spread around the globe. The infamous Spanish flu of 1918 killed 25 million people across the world. Influenza experts have been worried stiff that a future variant of flu could be as devastating. If a mathematical model could be made to predict the rate and direction of its spread, it could be invaluable in helping to prevent a disaster like this happening again. In 1983, Ravachev's huge 90-page manuscript, in English, flopped onto those scientists' desks. It was full of impenetrable mathematics. Several specialists are now poring over it to decide whether it represents a major advance in mathematical modelling or not. Their urgency stems not only from pure scientific interest in influenza, but also from the disturbing nature of the correspondence that has since been received from Rivachev. He was pleading for help in the foundation of an international monitoring system for new outbreaks of disease. But it became clear he was no longer interested in natural outbreaks, but those accidentally or deliberately caused by man. There are three ways to succeed in creation by dint of recombination or alteration of genes of a quite new expansive strain, to modify some medieval strains, making them acquire resistance to antibiotics, and to insert an appropriate gene into potential pandemic strain, for instance, into proper, very new or very old influenza strain. He quoted at length from the United Nations scientific paper published by a microbiologist, Saran Narang, no one can guarantee that irresponsible people with adequate training will not use recombinant DNA technology to develop instruments of destruction. Virulent organisms of frightening potency might be developed and used as weapons for use in war, political terrorism or repressive manipulation of whole populations. He then began paraphrasing poetry to make his point. Thus and so, all the above gives not a glimmer of hope and indeed the microbes are the force to come of the weak, wicked ones. All the more so that the tiny and reliable aerosol means of their delivery are now devised. It may be said after Robert Frost, some say the world should end in fire, and much is done for this desire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that strains are also great, and even better would suffice. Ravachev has clearly moved from public health to biological warfare, but what exactly is he trying to tell us? Already, one American publication has considered the worst possible interpretation, that Ravachev is warning us the Soviet military have become interested in his work as a way of predicting the spread of a biological weapon. If such a model worked, theoretically, an aggressor might be able to predict when such an agent would rebound on his own population and marshal vaccine resources to combat it, resources his enemies wouldn't have. But that may be presumptuous. All Ravachev's correspondence is written on official institute stationery. He's known to work here. And mailed through normal channels, it seems inconceivable that his letters are not being monitored. Either he's running great personal risk or his fears received the backing of his superiors. It could merely be that Ravachev is eccentric, or he could be sharing fears with Western scientists about terrorist use of biological weapons. It could even be a rather esoteric propaganda exercise on the part of the Russians. No one has yet spoken to Ravachev about those concerns, but he does exist and is a bona fide scientist. 
the affair remains a very worrying straw in the wind. There's rising international concern about the re-emergence of biological warfare in the 1980s. In April and May this year, and quite unconnected to the Ravachev affair, America's prestigious Wall Street Journal issued a massive eight-part series accusing the Soviet Union of preparing for biological warfare using genetic engineering, creating appalling scenarios like inserting genes for lethal cobra venom into easily transmitted viruses like influenza. A sword in the DNA helix itself. Well, I think the Wall Street Journal uh, articles create a climate of fear and create a climate in which uh, leaders and citizens think that one has to be ready to meet what the, pos the enemy society seems to be preparing to do. So that if you are led to believe that the Soviet Union is acting as if biological warfare is a legitimate way to achieve their results, it becomes very uh, persuasive that you have to do something to convince them that they can't do that and they won't succeed if they try to do that. And the best way or the way in which other governments, including our own, has always acted is to develop their own capability to do the same thing. And that's how deterrence operates in the nuclear area. And I fear that unless we are reassured effectively about what the Soviet Union is doing, we could witness a biological weapons arms race that is every bit as scary as the nuclear arms race has been. Villain of the Wall Street Journal piece is Professor Yuri Ovchinikov, Vice President of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. He is accused of running Russia's biological warfare program. Yet many scientists have severely criticized the articles because they know of Chinnikov and his work. They are personally prepared to vouch for his character. But in Soviet military power, the American Department of Defense's annual assessment of Soviet capabilities, those claims have received official support. There is an apparent effort on the part of the Soviets to transfer selected aspects of genetic engineering research to their biological warfare centers. For biological warfare purposes, genetic engineering could open up a large number of possibilities. Many of Britain's top microbiologists are members of our Ministry of Defense's Biology Advisory Board. The very list is classified, but one of them has admitted to us that there is renewed interest in biological warfare. He would not elaborate. Potentially. All this after Richard Nixon led the world into junking their biological weapons in 1969. And profoundly affect the health of future generations. Therefore, I have decided that the United States of America will renounce the use of any form of deadly biological weapons that either kill or incapacitate. Mankind already carries in its own hands too many of the seeds of its own destruction. These words were designed to put an end to a sordid 30-year history of research development and production of biological warfare agents. The modern history of germ warfare began in 1940. The Japanese used germ bombs against a number of Chinese cities in Manchuria during the Second World War. Those facts were deliberately covered up by both the British and American governments. They've only come to light after persistent use of the Freedom of Information Act and personal research in Japan by author and journalist John Powell. The first one that the Chinese suspected was in the fall of 1942 at a town uh, Ningbo near Shanghai. Japanese plane flew over, uh, circled around the city. No bombs were dropped, which the people expected, but and then flew away. Uh, the town, within a couple of days, uh, the town was infested with fleas, a much bigger flea influx than uh, normal, but still they, uh, you know, thought this was just seasonal weather. Well, within uh, a week or a little more, people began coming down with plague. A total of 99 plague cases were reported, uh, of which 98 uh, died. And uh, the Chinese felt this was very uh, suspicious, and then they uh, made a, uh, had a rat extermination campaign, and none of the rats had plague. And 
So this would be the first time in human history of a substantial outbreak of plague in the uh, human population without at first uh, being an epizootic in the rat population. So the Chinese concluded that uh, plague had been dropped. The Japanese campaign was made possible by research done here at Camp 731 near Harbin. Over 3,000 prisoners of war, Chinese, Russians, even Americans, were done to death here in conditions of total inhumanity. Well, in one uh, experiment, they uh, took a group of prisoners uh, out into a field, uh, tied them to stakes, they covered their heads uh, with helmets, uh, they tied wire mesh around their bodies, and they just left their uh, buttocks exposed, uh, pointing toward the center. And uh, in the middle of this group, they exploded a bomb uh, contaminated with uh, anthrax spores. And the fragments uh, hit the uh, prisoners and infected them. They did very similar experiments, putting the prisoners in different positions with uh, gas gangrene, uh, with plague, bacilla. One Japanese scientist, in fact, he's still alive. I interviewed him last spring in uh, Tokyo. He experimented with uh, a number of uh, fever diseases. And in one experiment, uh, he had six or eight people that he infected uh, with hemorrhagic fever. And um, so to uh, determine, uh, have a real clinical test, uh, after two or three days, he killed one of them and autopsied him to see the extent of the uh, virus in uh, various internal organs. A few days later, he uh, killed another one. And as the uh, summary which he gave to uh, United States investigators states at the bottom, uh, there were no survivors due to the practice of, as he put it, sacrificing the experimentees. As the tide of war turned against them, they killed the remaining prisoners and fled. The commander of the whole program was General Shiro Ishii. He was captured by the Americans and taken to Tokyo. The Russians got hold of their share of Japan's biological warriors and put them on trial here at Khabarovsk in Siberia. Twelve of them testified to the experiments. How they bred fleas as carriers of epidemic diseases, how Ishii developed bacterial bombs and methods of spraying infected fleas from aircraft, and how they had reduced human prisoners to the level of laboratory rats. The Russians published their account. It was immediately derided by the Americans. There was no proof, they said, that the Japanese had ever been in a position to wage biological war. But the Russians were determined to interrogate all the Japanese suspects. They asked the Americans to turn over General Ishii and his colleagues for further debriefing. At first, the, the Americans seemed as if they would be willing. They subsequently thought they'd better find out a little bit more themselves. After further debriefing of uh, General Ishii, they and his colleagues, they realized that there was a great deal of material that the interrogators uh, available weren't competent to assess. So they radioed to Washington to ask for experts, microbiologists to be sent out to help with the debriefing. And one of these, uh, a Dr. Edwin Hill, who was the chief at Camp Dietrich, the biological warfare establishment in the United States, was one who was actually sent out. And he spent about a month out in Japan debriefing the, the 12 or 15 Japanese experts that were available. And he actually wrote a report on this, and he said that the material that he had obtained was invaluable that it could never have been obtained in the United States because of scruples attached to experiments on humans and that it was obtained at fairly cheaply uh, and uh, that there was no way in which this information should be given to the Russians for the prosecution of these Japanese scientists for war crimes. And in fact, the, the deal that was eventually done was one of the Americans obtaining research information in exchange for the Japanese having immunity from prosecution. Initially, the State Department objected. They felt that they should try and obtain the information from Ishii without offering immunity from prosecution. But the rest of the, uh, the Army, the Air Force, and people in the Navy felt that there was no way in which General Ishii would proffer this information unless he was offered immunity from prosecution. And this, in the event, is what happened. In fact, America had been in the germ warfare business too, since 1941, in a tripartite project with the British and the Canadians. 
the main American centre was here at Camp Dietrich in Maryland. They had already evaluated hundreds of diseases against man, animals and plants. Biological devices were exploded in this giant sphere to record the survival and dispersal of bacterial pathogens. All Ishii's research was sucked into this burgeoning American program. These are the blueprints for Ishii's bacterial bombs, including porcelain bombs. They are all registered at Camp Dietrich. The particular value of Ishii's contribution to the American biological warfare program was that he provided the Americans with details of bombs. They had tested a variety of these in the field and he could tell them exactly what had worked and what hadn't. He could also tell them what organisms had been tested in the field and what effect they had had. The Americans were never able to do that kind of thing. And then finally, of course, he had all of the experimental evidence, the tests on animals and the tests on humans, where he could tell the Americans in detailed protocols what the effect of a particular agent would be one day, two days, two weeks after someone had been in infected. That was information that the Americans could never have obtained by themselves and it was proffered to them on a plate. Well, these, this is the anthrax. Yeah, this, this is, is the, the testing for anthrax. Yeah, the testing for anthrax, and uh, which was mostly uh, put on feathers. Mm -hmm. At least that's what they told me. James Endicott was a Christian missionary working in China during the Korean War in the early 50s. He was one of a number of Western observers who were taken by the Chinese and North Koreans to view evidence they had amassed to back their claims that the Americans had used germ warfare against them no, during the war. Crickets or grasshoppers or I think mostly crickets. Mm -hmm. He was shown fragments of porcelain bombs in which said the Chinese flies, spiders and feathers had been found, all infected with anthrax. Leaflet bombs, similar in size to the American 500-pound bomb, which the Chinese claimed had been found full of infected insects. And cardboard cylinders, with small parachutes attached, said to have contained infected midges. Endicott saw evidence of massive mobilization of public health workers, which the Chinese said were to fight the effects of germ warfare. He met many of China's top microbiologists, mobilized into field laboratories who claimed to have found evidence of typhoid, cholera, plague, and anthrax. He couldn't believe that he was being treated to an elaborate hoax. And this uh, rather older farmer rather convinced me. He said, I, I got up early in the morning and I went out to the cornfield and it, it, there was still a little snow on the ground, he said, and I saw these flies and spiders, insects, and I was quite surprised. So I said to him, well, tell me, why would you be going out into the cornfield early in the morning? Oh, he says, I went out to do my daily business. <laughs> and so he phoned the, the local uh, official, and the Red Cross came out, and they collected these insects, and they found that they had been uh, heavily inoculated with uh, uh, typhoid, um, a, a form of cholera and bubonic plague, fleas with bubonic plague. Endicott had seen enough. He held a press conference. I came to the Northeast and interviewed the public health authorities and people of all walks of life. I have seen all kinds of incriminating evidence of American germ warfare. After seeing all this evidence, I know that the American government has carried out large-scale germ warfare on the Chinese mainland. His was a minority voice. Those Chinese claims have been ridiculed by others. Many of the insects they claimed to have found appeared in the depth of winter, well out of season, when their chances of survival were minimal. And despite claims of fleas, the houseflies, tarantula spiders, springtails and crickets found would be unlikely choices for carrying disease. They are not normally associated with epidemics, an international scientific commission investigated these highly abnormal phenomena and concluded, however, that it was not evidence of a colossal propaganda blunder, but evidence of widespread American experimentation with germ warfare. The Americans have hotly denied those allegations ever since, and to this day, they remain unsubstantiated.
But what has emerged is that at the same time as the Korean War, the Americans were conducting an extraordinary series of germ warfare experiments on their own unwitting population. On the 27th of September, 1950, a US Navy minesweeper steaming outside the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco Bay opened its hatches, pulled out aerosol nozzles, and let loose a dense cloud of bacterium called Serratia marcescens. The time was closely calculated. Meteorological conditions meant the cloud would spread right across San Francisco and into the Oakland Bay area. It was one of a series of six experimental attacks on San Francisco. The aim, to mimic the spread of a deadly bug in order to test the vulnerability of cities to biological attack. The Serratia marcescens had been supplied by British scientists at Porton Down. Codenamed 8UK, it was supposed to be a mild bacterium which was not pathogenic to man, a harmless simulant. Lying in the path of that cloud of Serratia was the Stanford Medical Center. The windows would have been open for ventilation at that time of year, and lying inside, recovering from a prostate operation, was Edward Nevin. Four days later, he became seriously ill and died. The autopsy demonstrated a colonization, uh, large clusters of the bacterium Serratia marcescens clustered on the mitral valve of his heart. And the conclusion of the autopsy surgeon was that Edward Nevin died secondary to or from the infection of, from Serratia marcescens which lodged in his heart and stopped his vital organs as it grew into the large colony. In 1950, of course, no one except the Defense Department knew about the tests. To the doctors at Stanford Medical Center, the Serratia epidemic went down in medical history as practically the first time Serratia had proved harmful to man. Unfortunately for the government, Ed Nevin left a considerable lineage of Nevins in his wake. And when information on the 1950 tests eventually came out, they put two and two together. His grandson, Ed Nevin, is a lawyer. And before the Defense Department could say bacterium, they were being sued for millions for negligence. In 1981, a small amount of 8UK remained in storage and was available for microbiological examination. Unfortunately, 30 years after the event, no samples of the strain of serratia that killed Ed Nevin Sr. remained to compare it with. Nevertheless, the government concluded that the strain sprayed was not the same one that killed Ed Nevin. It was sheer coincidence. Experts testified for both sides and the case was dismissed. Even if the event was coincidental, it is quite clear that the US Army knew they were taking a calculated risk disseminating that bacterium on a vast urban population. Since 1945, Serratia had caused several infections among their own laboratory workers at Camp Dietrich. I think it's fair to characterize that event as the, with the exception of the Civil War in the 1860s, the only time where the United States government through its military attacked its own people. No scientific justification can be offered for such a terrible prostitution of scientific method. In 1950, a series of experiments began using turkey feathers to spread diseases. They tested the system out for cereal rust spores and diseases that could affect livestock like hog cholera. The feathers were thought ideal for the job. Millions of bacterial spores or viruses could be held by these very fine barbs. In the hog cholera experiments, they even tried to find out which colors were attractive to pigs by dyeing feathers a multitude of colors and spreading them around pig pens. They found out the pigs rejected red, black and blue feathers and preferred yellow and white, which they would attempt to eat. The program culminated in a test at Eglin Air Force Base in 1951 where a bomb containing infected feathers was exploded over tethered pigs. It worked. Whatever happened in Korea, we do know that in 1951 and 1952, the American Joint Chiefs of Staff were interested in attaining an offensive biological warfare capability. It wasn't just defense that they were concerned about. It was the offensive use of biological warfare agents. And they were exhorting the various services, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, to do further testing of biological warfare agents. We know from the documents that have been obtained under the Freedom of Information Act by a number of journalists and scientists 
that there was an aircraft, the F-7F, tested in the United States for the uh, deployment of biological warfare agents in a slurry. The same aircraft was actually used in Korea as well. We know that there were 126 Air Force personnel who were seconded to the United States Chemical Corps. The Chemical Corps was in charge of the biological warfare program, and they were seconded for extensive uh, training uh, in the area of biological warfare. We also know that casings for the disbursement of plant pathogens, plant diseases, were also sent abroad in the 1951-1952 period. So you have a body of circumstantial evidence to show and to suggest that the Americans were clearly anxious to attain a biological warfare capability. It's now clear that by 1953, the Americans were still well short of a fully-fledged offensive biological weapon. All manner of tests continued. In 1954, billions of mosquitoes were released in Georgia and Florida to test their efficiency as yellow fever vectors. Operation Big Buzz. Fleas were exploded from bombs to prove that they could survive the stress. Operation Big Itch. In 1953, a Mercury sedan patrolled New York on a highly clandestine mission. Reports suggest it was fitted with a false exhaust pipe through which a chemical designed to simulate bacterial aerosols was pumped. It turned Manhattan into an experimental area, spreading the simulant on major roads and down underpasses. Agents would come along in its wake with monitoring equipment to test how far the simulant had spread. These vulnerability tests spread to the New York subway system in a series of experiments that went on until 1969. It's possible the Americans had got the idea from the allegations in the mid-30s of a British journalist who claimed the Germans had conducted similar tests prior to World War II on the Paris Metro and London Underground. In the American tests, agents would enter the subway carrying containers of another harmless bacterium called Bacillus subtilis. The containers looked like blacked-out electric light bulbs. Thrown onto the tracks in the path of oncoming trains, they were whipped up into an aerosol that spread throughout Manhattan. All that ended with Richard Nixon's moratorium in 1969. It led to an international treaty which set the new ground rules for military biology. Each state party to this convention undertakes never in any circumstances to develop, produce, stockpile, or otherwise acquire or retain microbial or other biological agents or toxins, whatever their origin or method of production, of types and in quantities that have no justification for prophylactic, protective, or other peaceful purposes. This is where America's Department of Defense does most of its defense biology today under the terms of that treaty the U.S. Army's Research Institute for Infectious Diseases, USAMRID for short. It's located at Fort Detrick, Maryland, on the site of the old biological warfare laboratory. The isolation area for the reception of dangerously ill services personnel. There's strict security against contamination. The Army claims much of its research is focused on treatment of virulent viral diseases its personnel may encounter by straying into natural outbreaks while on duty in exotic parts of the world, like Africa, Central America, and the Far East. They say they're in the business of public health. Their research means understanding these pathogens more clearly and designing vaccines for their troops to combat them. The uh, Biological Weapons Convention uh, allows for defense against potential biological agents. And uh, in that context, uh, we are developing a system of medical countermeasures, both prophylactic and therapeutic, 
against those agents that we feel are important. Indeed, a number of the agents that we work with pose a natural disease threat. The viruses of Lassa, Ebola, and Marburg have all appeared, or at least gained our attention or our knowledge, in the past 20 years. So we have uh, very little experience with those agents, and people have not sent forces into areas where these viruses are endemic. But how normal are their public health priorities? The dangerous viruses handled here, like Lassa fever, do occur in parts of tropical Africa, and they are lethal, but they're not very contagious. The risk of being infected is actually very small. Take Marburg disease. The virus which causes it nearly killed this scientist at Porton Down after a rare laboratory accident. In the field, infections of Western travellers are equally rare. The possibility of it running riot around a rapid deployment force is remote. The, uh, the viruses that are important in our program are uh, such things as Venezuelan equine encephalomyelitis, uh, Rift Valley fever, uh, chikungunya, Lhasa, Ebola, Marburg, Korean hemorrhagic fever, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, uh, Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, Argentinian hemorrhagic fever, tick-borne encephalitis. There may be more. Those are the ones that come to mind at this point. If I was worried about Nicaragua and troops training down there, uh, I'd want to make sure they didn't get traveler's diarrhea, and so I'd have a lot of people working on that, because that's a problem with troops, all kinds of things, dysentery, whatnot. Instead, of, we find that they're working with very exotic and coincidentally very much more deadly microbes, be they viruses or bacteria, like Marburg Ebola virus, Korean hemorrhagic fever virus, Rift Valley fever virus, that affect, you know, very few people every year, which are not major problems that we could expect our troops to face. Instead, they're working with organisms that are just simply terribly, terribly lethal. In fact, what motivates much of the research here is suspicion. One of the top priorities is anthrax. It rarely causes disease in humans nowadays, but it's an old BW favorite. Scientists here are using new techniques of genetic engineering to isolate the genes of the anthrax organism and clone them into common bacteria to study the anthrax toxins in great detail. Because they believe the Russians are stockpiling anthrax as a biological weapon. In October 1979, Now Magazine published a sensational story. An accident at a Soviet germ warfare factory had killed thousands. The magazine placed the disaster at Russia's main science city, Novosibirsk in Siberia. They were 600 miles out. The mistake was corrected and Sverdlovsk in the Urals became identified as the site of the alleged fiasco. Sverdlovsk is a major industrial city. It's closed to foreigners. The Americans monitored it for months using spy satellites. On the outskirts of the city was a military complex in an industrial area which had been suspected for some time of being a biological weapons factory. It was believed that on or about the 2nd of April 1979, an explosion occurred here at compound 19 that released billions of deadly anthrax spores into the atmosphere. For this pair, sanctuary lies in a patch of woodland a few miles ahead. They can't rest until they reach it. The main herd has already got there safely. Finally, the stragglers emerge from the dust. Nothing unusual. Stid calf is still blinded by sand. Its mother does everything possible to help it. The storm 
is now subsiding. But not all the elephants have been so lucky. One youngster has got lost. Thirsty and exhausted, it follows the tracks of its mother, but sadly, in the wrong direction. a bit of DNA which can duplicate itself independently of the major chromosome of the microorganism. And these bits of DNA, plasmids, can readily be isolated in the laboratory, manipulated, studied, cut up, pieced back together, and are just a, a microbiologist's dream in terms of manipulation. That makes the study of these toxins and their genes extremely simple. It also raises the possibility, since these genes can be so readily isolated in pure form from the plasmid, that they can be manipulated to make them more potent, or to combine them, to splice them together with genes that will, say, make the, the bacterium resistant to a whole range of antibiotics, which might be used to treat the anthrax, or to introduce other genes or other characteristics which will make anthrax a better weapon. So it's a concrete, specific example of how recombinant DNA technology can be used in the weapons business. And of course, the same would apply to almost any biological agent that the Army wished to develop. The Army argue that their genetic engineering work on anthrax is purely defensive, to produce a vaccine against it. Richard Goldstein, however, believes that genetic engineering, largely unforeseen in 1969, has changed the picture substantially with respect to the potential for biological warfare. They signed that treaty, all the nations signed that treaty, because they had nothing to give away. It was the original Emperor's New Clothes kind of thing. At that time, no one in their right minds really would have thought of, of BW, because if the wind would blow the wrong way, uh, your own troops are susceptible to your own agents. The really fundamental change that's occurred in the last 10 or 15 years is not that we can manipulate organisms and make them more pathogenic. In fact, we can, but that's, that's not the fundamental change. The fundamental change is the ability to make vaccines against almost any organism that one might consider using in biological warfare. And I don't even mean simply vaccines for humans, but also for animals and also for genetically engineering plants that would be resistant to one type of blight or another type of blight. The really fundamental change in being able to do all of these things has come about through genetic engineering. One can make vaccines very, very easily and make extremely efficacious vaccines. We feel that a, uh, a strong uh, defensive posture uh, against uh, potential BW weapons is a deterrent to the use of those weapons. And yes, we do have a uh, broad spectrum, if you will, of uh, vaccines uh, on which we are working and some of these have already reached uh, at least the stage where they are in clinical trials and uh, materials have been uh, stockpiled. The army are deploying vaccines as if they were ballistic missiles but there are limitations because in biological warfare the game favors the aggressor the defender has always to guess which organism or which genetic variant will be used in order to prepare adequate vaccine defense. Biological defense only really makes sense if you have the means of offense worked out too. Defensive biology is in some ways a totally spurious term. So does the treaty have a loophole? The treaty says that we do away with all stockpiles of biological weapons. Number one, there's no verification. Any country simply comes back nine months after they sign it and says, we verify that we've destroyed our stockpiles. Number one, no verification. Number two, it says you do away with all BW systems except, and then there's a big except there, okay, in quantities. Quantities is a very ambiguous word. When you think of the fact that you can put 10 to the 11th, 10 to the 12th viruses in one tiny drop from an eyedropper, quantities, you know, one has to consider what quantities means. Not only that, it says in quantities appropriate for prophylactic or defensive purposes. And then again, one has to think about every word of a treaty is important and how every word can be read and misread 
and mid hunting making rockets in miss Most of the Western European countries, seems like the Soviets from what we hear, all then look at the treaty as saying that they can continue on with defensive biological warfare if there can be such a thing. And they claim defensive biological warfare under the treaty means that you can have any organism you want, you can make vaccines against it, and you can make dispersal systems. And in fact, we're doing that with certain types of microbes, and so are other countries. You only have to look at the interpretation Henry Kissinger put on the wording of that treaty to see where the ambiguity lies. The United States biological programs will be confined to research and development for defensive purposes. Well, this does not preclude research into those offensive aspects of biological agents necessary to determine what defensive measures are required. I don't think DOD is doing anything, quote, wrong that violates the treaty. In fact, everything I see, they're not doing anything wrong. Nonetheless, the treaty allows them to do what they're doing, which is to work with the deadliest microbes, to develop vaccines against them, and to look at dispersal systems and develop dispersal systems. And of course, for, in order to defend against potential BW, they have to understand how dispersal systems work. Nonetheless, when they have all three of those key ingredients in their hands, they also have an offensive weapon. To me, there's no difference. It's a very thin line. In the end, it boils down to trust. You either believe this man's motivation or not, because you can't distinguish between offense and defense from what's in his laboratory. OK, <clears throat> we're not involved in, in any offensive work whatsoever. Uh, we uh, abide by the Biological Weapons Convention. And I might add that all of the work which is done here is unclassified. Uh, it's published in the open literature. Uh, not only do our investigators have the opportunity to publish, they are encouraged to publish. So basically everything that goes on here gets into the open literature. And I'm certain that the people who read those publications, the, the scientists themselves, uh, probably uh, give it the most critical analysis. And uh, we have never been accused of uh, carrying on any kind of an offensive program. Additionally, the very fact that you and I can sit here and, and carry on a conversation like that, uh, or like this, suggests that it's uh, completely open, completely above board. Nothing's classified. The value of genetic engineering is that you can transplant genes from human beings, plants and animals into common bacteria in such a way that they will activate there and make a product. It's only a surgical way of transferring genetic material which mimics what many bacteria do naturally down tubes like this when they mate. In the same way that scientists are using bacteria to make human insulin and interferon, theoretically genes for resistance to drugs or for increased virulence could be transplanted. For instance, bacteria could be engineered to be selectively resistant to many outdated antibiotics widely in use in the third world. If released there, they could spread, creating a major epidemic. But that disease would be unlikely to rebound on a more sophisticated country with more modern antibiotics at its disposal. A perfect covert agent, for instance, to destabilize a third world country. A third world country is poor. That's, that's the first thing about it. It does not have the medical infrastructure that an advanced country does. It doesn't have the medical personnel, the public health facilities, the hospitals, the roads, the sanitation facilities, and therefore is vulnerable to attack by a biological weapon, by a disease-causing agent. Second of all, many of these countries are monocultural. They will depend for their economic livelihood on a single crop whether it is a cash crop for export, like sugar in the case of Cuba, or a, a crop for, for human consumption like rice. If this crop is targeted successfully with a mold or a rust or 
plant pathogen, then the country can be devastated relatively easily. So that is a second important reason. So I think that, that when we think of these weapons now, given the present state of the art of biological weaponry, the most likely targets would be underdeveloped countries. Este tema que voy a abordar es importante, muy importante. En los últimos dos años han azotado a nuestro país cuatro nocivas plagas que han afectado animales, plantas y por último también a las personas. La fiebre porcina africana, la roya de la caña, el moho azul del tabaco y por último el virus número dos del dengue. No pocos ciudadanos en este país están profundamente convencidos de que estas enfermedades, especialmente el dengue, fueron introducidas en nuestro país por el imperialismo yanqui. In 1971, the Cubans had to slaughter half a million pigs because of the first epidemic of African swine fever ever reported in the Western Hemisphere. An American newspaper claimed from CIA sources that anti-Castro guerrillas had been supplied with the virus by the CIA. But the Cubans have as yet been unable to prove it scientifically. This is precisely why biological warfare is so destabilizing. If it's done properly, it should be impossible to distinguish it from natural disease, unless someone is caught red-handed. Take dengue, for example. In June 1981, this viral disease hit Cuba. Over 100 people died. It was the first time the type 2 dengue virus had appeared in the Caribbean in such a virulent form. Although very unusual, there's no proof it was anything other than a natural outbreak. Plant diseases such as the damage to sugarcane are just as ambiguous. It could easily be biological warfare. But equally, once extensive monoculture is introduced into a country, it often follows that a new pest arrives to take advantage of it. Certainly, you can excuse the Cubans their suspicions. In the early 60s, the CIA plotted to poison Castro with botulinus toxin and to impregnate his personal underwater gear with fungal toxins, as well as countless conventional attempts on his life. But until the Cubans back their recent allegations with facts, we will not know whether this is a biological warfare vendetta or Cuban propaganda. Throughout the 60s, the CIA built up a secret biological weapons stockpile here at Fort Detrick in the Special Operations Division. They should have thrown it away under President Nixon's directive in 1969, but they didn't. In 1975, a Senate committee discovered just what was in their secret cache. It contained 50 grams of smallpox virus and several grams each of brucellosis, tuberculosis and tularemia. Food poisoning bacteria and an array of toxins like snake venom, botulinus, lethal shellfish toxin and anthrax. More worrying still, the CIA agents, when questioned by Senator Church's committee, defended this clandestine biological arsenal by placing themselves above the law. They claimed that as they were not a military organization, they were not bound by the Biological Weapons and Toxins Treaty. The commercial growth of biotechnology has raised new fears about the nefarious use of modern biology. Proliferation of nuclear weapons has been held in check by the enormous cost of the technology. But microbiological technology is much more available off the shelf, it's much cheaper, and it's far less detectable. Biological weapons are a business small countries can afford to get into. In a recent monograph, Neil Livingston, a prominent expert on security matters, claims that the same argument may soon apply to terrorists. 
To create a fissionable weapon today, even a very dirty device, would probably take hundreds of millions of dollars at the very least, and uh, very elaborate technical uh, uh, resources, uh, training, uh, data, and other material. And by contrast, uh, uh, a rudimentary biological or chemical weapon uh, could be made for uh, under a thousand dollars in the privacy of one's home or garage. Uh, and quite frankly, there are great economies in killing people uh, using such weapons. Uh, a recent study by uh, uh, a Stockholm Institute indicated that uh, it would take approximately $2,000 uh, per square kilometer to kill the same number of people that it would take a dollar's worth of biological material. Bologna Railway Station, 1980, after a terrorist bomb blast. According to a recent privileged study in the United States, any group who sees its aims furthered by the sort of indiscriminate violence seen at Bologna could turn to biological weapons. And it would be wrong to assume they would lack the technical expertise to experiment with biological devices. But what evidence is there that biological weapons are becoming more attractive to terrorists? In 1980, for example, French police discovered a German Red Army Faction safe house in Paris where the terrorists were engaged in the production of a botulinal weapon. We've also discovered uh, right-wing uh, radicals in the United States in the city of Chicago trying to develop an anthrax weapon. We've discovered, uh, and by this I mean U.S. authorities, have discovered uh, various literature on building uh, chemical or biological weapons in safe houses of any number of terrorist groups. And we know that even uh, religious cults and some uh, uh, ethnic radical groups have flirted with the idea of constructing such a, such a weapon or device. The Symbionese Liberation Army, for example, had manuals on chemical and biological warfare in one of their safe houses in California at the time of their discovery. And so what we're seeing around the world is an increasing pattern. I can envision a scenario where a terrorist group would acquire a rusty old Panamanian or Liberian freighter and steam it up through the Narrows and anchor it off the tip of Manhattan and using internal generators and dry biological material and external booms would pump that biological, lethal biological material into the air and that it would blow over all of New York City or all of Manhattan and that these buildings today, the, the great skyscrapers of New York, their ventilation systems would suck in the material. If it were slow acting, of course, we would not see any results, maybe for hours, days, weeks. Uh, if it were a very quick acting material, it would turn the New York uh, skyscrapers into slaughterhouses. Livingston is not alone. A U.S. Army study estimates that enough bacterial aerosol to attack a major city could be produced in a relatively crude laboratory for under $13,000. Chillingly, they went further and itemized an even cheaper home laboratory for doing it with yellow fever infected mosquitoes. You'd need to rent a suitable building for about three months. They estimated $1,200. You'd also need two laboratory technicians for the same period another $5,000. You could easily knock up some mosquito cages yourself and a vacuum cleaner would make a suitable aspirator for transferring your mosquitoes into a munitions box. You'd need guinea pigs as a source of animal blood and a couple of rhesus monkeys at $375 each and food for the developing larvae. The report recommends Purina dog chow. Add some shelving and pans and a few miscellaneous items and you get a grand total of $9,066. Starting cultures for a wide range of dangerous pathogens are available from most reputable commercial culture collections. They're sent through the mail and they're surprisingly cheap. Of course, no one's suggesting they'd let anyone just walk off with Bacillus anthracis or cholera vibrios but microbiologists we've talked to feel that it wouldn't be beyond an intelligent, determined individual to get a job in a university or research institute that would give him access to official stationery, forms and signatures 
and allow him to forge his way into what is, after all, only a sophisticated form of mail order. The genetic engineering industry has been non-committal about genetic engineering and biological warfare. There are now over 400 companies in the US alone. The future holds the prospect of massive financial gains. But they have only just emerged from a period of voluntary control self-imposed in 1975. The moratorium on many types of experiments was largely orchestrated by Professor Paul Berg of Stanford University at a meeting in Asilomar, California. There were fears at the time of the escape of genetically engineered organisms from the laboratory. Some observers felt the subject of biological warfare was brushed under the carpet even then. I was a party to the early drafts of the famous Berg letter, in which there was a paragraph at the end of said letter saying that we will uh, abjure and put it and, and uh, refrain from using recombinant DNA techniques for any purposes related to biological warfare research. That paragraph was taken out according to Richard Roblin who was the key drafter of this because it simply blurred the issues. We're dealing with the immediate hazards. Why look at the futuristic aspects which are not in front of us? Similarly, articles that were submitted, one in particular to the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science by Jackson et al., had a similar clause saying this technique which we've developed using a modification of the Berg process of uh, SV40 uh, recombinants could be a potential biological warfare agent and caution should be used in developing it. Well, as a cost of getting that paper published, one of the referees asked that that paragraph be deleted. Similarly, most biological recombinant DNA scientists that I've spoken with simply wish to put aside the issue of biological warfare. They don't want that to be visible. They don't want to discuss it. They don't want to flag it as a potential issue because perhaps in their view it's a red herring, but I think more because they just don't want to set the bird off singing inside the cage. They've had one episode of that already and it's been relatively disastrous in terms of impeding the progress of developing recombinant DNA organisms for proprietary purposes, for economic advantage. Dr. Joseph Perpich was one of the industry's self-elected policemen in those early days. He acknowledges that biological warfare is becoming an important issue. The potential of this technology um, is enormous, both in terms of its industrial applications, but also in its perversion. And indeed, when we at the NIH had to develop an environmental impact statement on the NIH guidelines, there was a section that we had to um, write and address, namely the use of this technology, the perversion of this technology for biological warfare and also for as a terrorist weapon. And at that point, um, it was clear that much of the research still was very basic, that there were many other um, materials other than biological materials that could be used for these purposes and we believed that the controls at that point were, um, were sufficient. But now um, there's a shift because the technology has moved so rapidly, rapidly from the laboratory to industrial application and with that to the concern about possible um, potential uh, being realized much more early for purposes of biological and chemical warfare. At a scientific meeting earlier this year, Dr. John Berkner of the Defense Intelligence Agency raised the alarm once more about Soviet perversion of biotechnology. He then revealed that a number of items of biotechnology hardware were already on a confidential military critical list and claimed America's biotechnology industry may actually be helping the Soviet's alleged program. The assertion here is that if the U.S. supplies an adversary nation such as the USSR, with technology related to those equipment items, then that nation's capability to produce and disseminate disease-causing warfare agents of biological origin will be enhanced. A complete overhaul of the American Department of Commerce guidelines for export of biotechnology to the Eastern Bloc is in the wind. A high-powered committee is being set up here. It'll include defense analysts, commerce specialists, and leading members of the genetic engineering industry and may lead to an export ban on many of their products. But they'll have a hard job developing a Fortress America approach. Today's scientific papers could be tomorrow's production technology. Genetic engineering moves that fast. 
and it depends on a huge amount of international collaboration to succeed. Whether genetic engineers in Britain, Western Europe and Japan like it or not, they're going to be drawn into America's debate on genetic engineering and biological warfare. I think that um, once this committee gets, the debate gets going, uh, there's going to be um, a lot of involvement by um, the, uh, the scientific and the industrial community abroad. There necessarily has to be. Because as the policies are developed and the regulations are developed, it's going to have to involve a concerted effort and concern by the U.S. allies, and particularly through these export control committees that operate now in Europe, where all of the com countries have to agree on licensing of products. And rapidly, as we develop the standards and criteria to guide our licensing of products um, and in terms of biotechnology, that necessarily will have a direct impact on our trading partners and how they would view those products because many of them as well have those technologies. And so I think um, rapidly whatever happens in that committee is going to be disseminated abroad and, and considered and debated. Meanwhile, expenditure at America's defense biology centers has multiplied fourfold in as many years. Over 30 contracts for genetic engineering have been issued to academic researchers and private industry. Today's troops already train in a chemical biological weapons environment. At least six genetic engineering laboratories are already competing with each other on projects designed to lead to advanced defenses against nerve gas. And thanks to genetic engineering, new biosensors capable of identifying a few particles of bacteria or viruses are also on the way. Much of that work is already classified. At Porton Down, new top security microbiological laboratories will soon be at the disposal of Britain's defense biologists. It's inconceivable that the Russians are doing anything less. And there's evidence of a direct approach by the US Army to America's top scientists. In 1982, they asked the Life Sciences Assembly of the National Academy of Sciences for help in identifying agents of the future. This was to include genetically engineered organisms. Luckily, the Academy saw the writing on the wall. The Assembly was deeply concerned about the request to consider defense against the agents of the future. It appreciated the need to design a defensive capability against agents that are likely to be developed, but considered the natural consequence of such a study to be the possible development of new offensive agents. I think the, the one reason why one should be worried about genetic engineering and its role in biological warfare is the growing interest in military circles in genetic engineering. It's not that at the moment we can say uh, that the military are designing a biological weapon using genetic engineering. It's just that genetic engineering is such a powerful tool. It's a revolution in biology that is going to equip the military, if they investigate it, with the potential to find very powerful weapons. It's in the nature of the military to investigate new technologies of this kind. And we know that they are in there actively doing that at the moment. Perhaps we are now at the stage that physicists were around the time of the development of the first atomic bombs, when they raised, began to raise concerns, but unfortunately without much effect. Uh, I think biologists and all scientists and the entire public, because it certainly can't be left to the biologists, have to concern themselves with this new kind of weaponry and prevent the escalation of a biological arms race.